Hey, g'day. Welcome to the Presto Show. This is where I do my thing. If you're new here, please check out the rest of my channel. Now, I've got over 140 videos on all sorts of topics. Now, as a retired industrial technology teacher, I taught high schoolers, woodworking, metalworking, engineering, design for over 35 years. And during that time, I didn't just teach that stuff, I also learned it myself. So in my own home workshop, I've done all sorts of skills and projects, and I've built on those skills and projects over the years. And now I thought it was time to give something of that back to the community. So in my channel, you'll find videos on clock making, on metal casting, on model engineering, CAD, CAM, all sorts of topics. So please check it out. If you're a returning viewer, welcome back. Hey, have you lost some weight? Anyway, you're looking great. Now, today's video is about the third part of building a power draw bar for a knee type milling machine. Now, in the last video I showed you, we tackled making the bores in two of the castings that make up this device, and I got that working well. And today was going to be about finishing off the draw bar and showing you how it works. Now, sadly, <laughs> I alluded to a problem in the last video that I was having with this build and I moved on a bit since then and I've done a bit of a redesign. Now as such, that's not all going to fit into today's video. So what we should be able to do today is to get the build up to the point where it is actually on the machine and you'll see the problem that I'm having. Some of you already know what that is. And then we'll look at the redesign. So let's have a look now at where we left off last time and that was fitting the linear bearings to one of the castings. The next operation on this casting here is to get the holes drilled to mount the linear bearings. Now, I put the fixture back in the vise. I should never have taken it out actually. But I've lined up a 12 millimeter pin with that existing hole. And I can put the bushes back in the casting and then realign everything on that fixture and clamp it down. And at the moment I've got my DRO zeroed out on that hole. So I can go around and drill a four hole pattern around the edge of that bore there. The diameter, the pitch circle diameter of our hole pattern is 38 millimeters. And we're using M4 socket head screws to hold these, but they'll be coming up from underneath. And we'll get uh, the four holes drilled in this end of the casting. And then we can just take that whole thing out, flip it around 180 degrees, screw it down tight again and drill the next hole pattern. Now, wouldn't it be ideal if I had a big accurate rotary table and it would save all of this messing around. But at present I don't have one, I've got a small one but it's not big enough to do this job here. And I know a lot of you are probably looking at this and saying, what a rigmarole uh, just to index this around 180 degrees. But that's the problem. Um, if you could just simply hold it by this center point and be able to turn that exactly 180 degrees each time, I wouldn't have a problem. But I just don't have that capability at the moment. So this is the next best thing. And as you can see, it's a, it really is a fairly simple setup, but it does require a little bit of preparation to make all of these uh, parts of the fixture. So let's go ahead now and get this screwed down tight and we'll drill our whole pattern and I'm using touch DRO to set off my four holes around that pitch circle diameter. This is the preview of the workspace that I've set up in touch DRO to do this job. So here we are right at the very center of the hole pattern at the moment. Here are the four hole centers. And if I select auto select nearest point, as I drive the spindle towards any one of these four points, this will reset itself as we approach the location to count back to zero. So let's try the first hole position. And what you should see now is in X, we're counting down towards zero. close enough and in Y okay 
So there's a bit of messing around, you can get that right on zero. We're not too bothered, if we get within 0 0.01, we're good. It's close enough. Okay, let's drill our first hole. I got to be carried away there and I forgot to swap drill bits <laughs> after the first hole. And uh, well, it shows that touch the arrow is good enough to pick up those four hole centers again without any problem. So we'll flip this around now, do the other end, and we'll get everything tapped. I was uh, watching one of Blondie Hack's videos recently and saw this little tool and I absolutely fell in love with it. And it's a genuine Noga. It wasn't cheap. Ah, so easy to use. Now, this is the setup I'm using here now. I've got a M4 tap in this Eclipse tap holder here, which has been pinned to a, a shaft that slides up and down in this collar. And these are interchangeable, so you can swap these, uh, these tapping spindles out. I've got uh, a bigger one for bigger taps. And the great thing is that it just holds everything absolutely square. And when you're dealing with small taps, that's really what you want. And the other good thing is it's got this sort of two-speed knob at the top here, so you can sort of rapidly advance the tap or back it out for that matter. And if you want a bit more torque, you can use a slightly larger diameter knob on top there. But don't have a lot of thread engagement on these. Uh, I've drilled that three and a half millimeters for an M4 tap, so they're driving through there quite freely. But if you need a bit more torque, just use the bigger knob. Oops, run out of uh, travel on that. <laughs> Wonder why that felt funny. That's better. Let's just run that through again. Now if you like the look of this George Thomas tapping and staking tool, there's a YouTuber who's recently done a complete series on a build of this device. I think he made the slightly larger version. There is a, another set of castings out there with uh, slightly longer arms. It's the whole thing has been scaled up a little bit. And I think his name is Metal Mill 52 but I'll check on that and I'll put the, the name at the bottom of the screen here. But he did an excellent video, uh, quite, a, quite a detailed video in fact, on building all of the parts for this device. But as a workshop accessory, it's well worth it. Mine doesn't get a lot of use, but on the occasions when you need to do something like this, it's absolutely perfect. Anyway, it won't bore you. Let's get all of these done. We'll get this part assembled. Already got these screws in and semi tight. And of course, this is the part where you work out how good your DRO is. And I'm happy to say, so far, everything's lining up. I'm just going to slacken them off a bit. And that is all very nicely aligned there. So we'll get these ones snug down. All right, put the others in later. It's all gonna come apart anyway for finishing. Let's just see how good we are at this point. All right, gotta be happy with that. 
Now remember, this is the whole goal of this, uh, <laughs> this very long drawn out process that I've used. Uh, I just wanted that to just fit on there and to be able to travel its full length without any binding or anything like that. And once we get these rods locked tight in into this base here, this should take all the torque from that butterfly impact wrench. Of course, if this was sloppy uh, and moved around a lot, as soon as you apply the torque with the wrench, this would try to skew in a clockwise rotation or anti-clockwise, depending on which way you're going. And that would just exacerbate the wear and the, the out of alignment. But I think this is going to work quite well. Here it is partially assembled now. One of the last tasks is to make this little casting fit onto the handle of the butterfly impact wrench. And this is going to allow me to fit a steel rod handle and we'll have to drill and tap the thread in there and then the steel rod will come out and bend down at 90 degrees and that will place the handle, the operating handle, at a more comfortable position lower than the bridge board head. So all we need to do here is to machine a pocket in this casting that fits over this ridge, drill a few fixing holes and get that assembled. And I made this casting just yesterday. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you check out my Instagram you'll see the pattern that I used to make this casting. So let's go ahead and get this fitted now and we're nearly done. This little um, boss on the top of this plate here has got a diameter of 16 millimeters or close enough and I'm just trying to align this broken 16 millimeter end mill. <laughs> yes, I do break them. And I don't have a fancy set of pins like uh, Joe Pysinski has. So I'm just sort of using uh, that as a visual representation of the center of the spindle. And just using touch, you can get that pretty close. It's not really critical. I think we're pretty good there. So I'll lock the table, go ahead and drill and tap that. That's an M10 thread, 16 millimeters deep. Get all this D-bird and then we can tackle this side here. I've set this part up in the vise, but I can't really get any parallels or anything underneath it. It's a, an awkward shape. So I just um, tighten the vise and I tap that down until it's level with the top of the vise. Not gonna do any really heavy milling on this, so I think we'll get away with it. I've got a, an eight millimeter ball nose end mill and what we need to do is uh, cut a groove that will clear that raised section there. And I've set my DRO to be the exact center of that part and I've got the tip of the ball nose end mill set to zero on the surface here. So I'll mill our groove uh, left to right, four millimeters deep, and uh, probably doesn't even need to be that deep actually. I think we'll just um, try it as we go. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Pretty close. Part of the complication is this little ridge here. Uh, I'm not sure why that's there, probably like a finger grip. We're either going to have to machine that off or we'll have to cut uh, a rebate on one side there to clear that. But well, we can go a bit deeper.
pretty sure we're clear there, but I'll just go another millimetre deep and then I think we're done. Alright, got plenty of clearance there which is good. Uh, next thing we need to do is drill a pattern of four holes in the casting so we can screw the casting to this paddle. I'll drill those tapping size for M4 and I still need to transfer the, the holes onto that paddle there. Not quite sure how we're going to do that yet. <laughs> um, let me think about it. Just uh, off camera I milled a little rebate down this side of the casting and that clears the rib down this side of the paddle. That all fits on there quite nicely now. I'll clamp this on the toolmaker's clamp and we'll pass the drill bit back through the four holes and then tap these M4, do a trial fit, and then I, we can turn our attention to making the, the rod handle for this side. So there's the casting attached to that paddle now. There are four M4 countersunk head screws on the back of that. When I do the drawings for this, I'll fix up these two hole positions here so they don't fall so close to that uh, recess on the back of the paddle. Just makes it a bit hard to do the countersinks. And we're going to get this back on the machine now. We're going to work out how we're going to fit a handle uh, permanently into this boss here. Okay, I'm just standing up on a ladder here so we can see the top of the machine. And uh, I've got the unit in place here now. And what we need to do is make some sort of extension handle that comes out and then down the side of the mill head so you can reach it easily. Now, I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, you just make a mirror image of this and run that handle down the left-hand side. And what I've done here is I've made up a little wire template and this just allowed me to try out a few different designs before I came up with this one. I think this one uh, clears everything mechanically, it clears the, the housing of the mill head and places the, the bottom of the handle in an easy to reach position. And what we need to do now is straighten this wire out and work out the total length of steel that we need to make this handle. And don't forget, there are two different operations you need to carry out here to make this thing work. So the first one is you've got to be able to pull down, and then you've either got to be able to push that paddle back or pull it forward, depending on which way you want to rotate the spindle. And I think this little wire handle allows you to do both of those things. Anyway, let's go and get this straightened out now and cut a piece of steel to length. That was my template. I straightened that bit of wire out and I got the length of that transferred onto this uh, 12 millimeter hot rolled steel and I threaded the ends um, to give me the correct thread engagement and I bent my template back again uh, so that we can get the angle right when we do the bends on this. Just want to get my approximate bend positions here. Got that sitting in the bar bender there, and we can use a bit of wire there as a template. That's pretty good. Okay, well that end is taken care of. Let's do the other one. Well, I'm sure you can see the problem there. Might need to heat that up and just sort of kink that back again. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I did need to adjust that a bit. I put two nuts on the end of that thread and just kinked the handle out a bit in the vise. 
However, the only thing I'm worried about here is this handle is very heavy and the springs on the pneumatic ports are very light. So there's a tendency for this to sort of accidentally engage when you pull it down. But let's put it up in the mill and see how it looks up there. Okay, I got all this back up here again now and you'll notice that I've changed out this socket. Now, I had a deep socket on that previously and I've swapped out for a standard socket with a 3 8 drive and that's got a 12 uh, sided interior spine and that now clears the top of the draw bar really well and there's a tendency when you're pulling it down to engage it to accidentally engage the motor sometimes going the wrong way so we need to do something about that now one of the reasons why this is now so sensitive apart from the weight of that handle and the inertia that that gives the whole system is the the actual lever arm now in the original paddle that we use on this impact wrench the lever arms roughly 20 millimeters and now we're going out to something like 200 millimeters so we've got a tenfold increase in the length of that lever arm so it's no wonder it's more sensitive now I've had a look inside the body of the impact wrench and the springs that control the valves inside there are very small and very light but physically there's not enough room to fit much more heavier springs in that system so what I looked at then was some way of increasing the amount of resistance underneath that paddle there. Now I went and bought a roll of this stuff. It's 10 millimeter square rubber and had to buy a five meter length, but it's not that expensive. And I made a little prototype uh, bumper here. And you can see it's got a bit of a cutout. And the idea was that these two sections here would provide the resistance as you operate the paddle. And that works reasonably well. I think it's probably, this uh, rubber is probably a bit too squishy, but uh, I've made another one and I'm not gonna do the cutout this time. We're just gonna put the piece of square rubber under the paddle. So let's try that and see how it goes. Here's a look inside the head of the impact wrench and you can see these two valves here which operate the motor in reverse its direction. And uh, this is the spring that you would have to swap out to make this much stiffer to operate and just physically there's not enough room in there to be able to do that. So I'm just going to gently put that back and uh, just be warned <laughs> you've got to do some disassembly to fix this and, and get rid of that problem. So this piece of 10 millimeter rubber is going to go roughly there. Just be a little bit careful you don't obscure this port and then we've got to put all of this back again. And I've had this apart a few times and I'm starting to damage this gasket here. So once again, just be warned, you've got to pull this apart to get this to work. And there are just four socket head screws going the top of this. And all of this has a tendency to sort of fly apart which uh, is never good. All right, now, I don't know if you can see, but that's a lot stiffer to operate now. There's a bit of rubber jam right down the bottom there, and you see how highly compressed that is. But let's put this back on the mill now and just see how it operates. All right, put that back up there now. Just excuse the rain on the roof, but I'm having to operate this with my left hand because I've got the camera in my right hand, but that goes down there now, and I can pull that down without accidentally operating the air. So let's pull it down and can go that way. Now, I've got no tool in the machine at the moment, but I'm just trying to demonstrate how you can pull that down without accidentally operating the air. All right, here we are. Now we're ready to go. Now I can't show you both ends of the mill at the same time, at least not with any sort of clarity. But this is my adjustable boring head. And let's try this in the spindle. Okay, push it up and then let's engage the drawbar. And that's tight, that's good. Now let's see if we can release it. Okay, and doesn't that look fantastic? Now the only problem is that not all of my R8 tools will drop out that easily. 
So certainly this does. I've got a number uh, three Morse taper to R8 adapter that drops out easily. Some of the collets do, but not all. And my big 16 millimeter keyless chuck does not. Now I don't know why. However, what I am planning to do is to make a modification to this pneumatic drawbar build. Now, if you are able to get all of your R8 tooling out easily, you don't need to do the modifications. You can just do what I've already done and you're golden. But if like me, you've got some of these tools that don't want to come out, we need to find a way of actually locking the pneumatic uh, impact wrench down and stopping it from moving upwards when we engage it. And what that does is it forces the drawbar to push down on the tool and disengage it from the taper. And that's what I'm planning to do to my pneumatic drawbar. But for the moment, I can get away with it. It's working for me. It, it gets a bit of a nuisance sometimes when you get a tool that hangs up in there and doesn't want to come out. But I'm going to show you what I have in mind with a 3D model and then we're going to look at that in the next episode. <laughs> now I said there was only going to be three, but things change. And like I said, for now, if you can make this work the way it is for you, brilliant, go ahead and do it. But uh, look at the modifications and then decide whether it's worth it or not. In this 3D model here, you can see the, the new parts that need to be made for the Mark II version of the power drawbar. The most obvious change is the extra height. So there will be new longer columns required, same material, but at the top they will need to have a spigot, 10 millimeter diameter, and a six millimeter internal thread. And the purpose of that is to be able to place a bridge plate across those two columns. Now this will be secured in place with a couple of uh, socket head cap screws or hex screws. And this is to allow you to actually get some downward force on the the actual pneumatic motor and that keeps it locked in that lower position so there are a number of other parts need to go on one or other of the columns and like i said before if you're left-handed you just simply swap all these parts and make a mirror image but there is a part that i'm calling a latch body and it's able to rotate uh, through roughly 90 degrees and keep the pneumatic motor down while you operate it uh, there's also a small handle attached to that and a retainer which needs to go on one of the 16 millimeter diameter columns. And the latch itself is a rotary device that uh, engages on the top of the pneumatic motor. Right, here's a 3D model of the, the mechanism now in the lowered position. And you might be able to see that the latch rotation handle is now moved forward. And this could be operated with your left hand if you're a right-handed person. So your right hand now goes on the handle to operate the pneumatic motor and your left hand can operate that latch rotation handle. And you can see now the latch is actually engaged on the top of the pneumatic motor. Now, um, I figured that it was a good idea that we were able to limit the rotation of the latch. So there are two pins. Uh, these can just be roll pins or solid pins. And in this close-up view here, you can see how they engage on the top of that bridge piece and their position, I've, in the actual 2D drawings, I've positioned these with dimensions so you can find those locations very easily. And finally, here's a sort of a, like a front view of the finished Mark II version. And I think it's going to be successful. Now, I've sort of got about 80% of the parts made at this point, And over the next couple of days, I should be able to get this completed. And that will appear in the next video. Now, my apologies that this has become a, you know, like a marathon four-part episode or series of episodes. But like I say, things change. And thanks for sticking with me so far. And I hope that if you decide to build one of these, you don't have to go to this trouble <laughs> that I'm doing here. Um, I'm sort of about 80% confident that I could probably get most of the tooling out of my Bridgeport head without bothering to fit these new parts. But I figured I might as well go the whole hog and see how it turns out. Okay, I'm just going to leave you some wildlife shots. These big eastern grey kangaroos appeared in our next door neighbour's paddock a couple of days ago. And uh, you'll see a beautiful flame tree that's growing in our front yard. It's a, a rainforest species and it flowers around about Christmas time every year. Absolutely brilliant red foliage. But these are individual flowers, they're not actually the, the leaves. The tree itself is deciduous and drops all its leaves 
and then it comes out with these beautiful red bell shaped flowers. So sit back and enjoy, it's Preso signing out, I'll catch you on the next episode.